thanks, Jerry, and thank you to Vertical Events for giving me the opportunity to come and speak to you people today about what we're doing in Cobalt in Namibia. Is that a disclaimer? I'll just start by talking a little bit about the corporate background of the company. We uh, were recapitalised at the beginning of this year uh, at one cent. The company was previously in, in uh, coal assets in Kyrgyzstan. Uh, which didn't, didn't work out too well. I joined the company first up as an investor at the beginning of the year and was brought on as a consultant to help the company find a project in the battery mineral space. Um, we have yeah, approximately 580 million shares on issue at the moment. Uh, market cap at the moment is around about 58 million, so we've had quite a good run, as you can see there, over the year um, with that uh, underlying thematic for battery minerals and in particular cobalt, as some others have, have talked about here. Uh, we've recently did a capital raising, uh, which leaves us with about six and a half million in cash at the moment. So well funded to progress our uh, aggressive exploration plans at uh, Apua in Namibia. Directors and management, myself, my background's as a geologist, as Jerry mentioned. We've got uh, Bill Oliver, who's also a geologist, our chairman. Uh, Pine Fund Vic, who is our Namibian director uh, and a representative of our largest shareholder, which I'll talk about a little bit more about as we move through the presentation. He's a metallurgist by background, so adds a lot to our board. And Ranko Matic, who's our uh, financial and corporate company secretary representation. So I'll just briefly summarise uh, why we're doing what we're doing. So Cobalt, as you've heard, uh, strong demand projections, electric vehicles, renewables, smartphones. Uh, Cobalt in particular, in, in terms of the battery thematic, is probably one of the most vulnerable parts of that supply chain, given that uh, most Cobalt, so 65%, approximately comes out of the DRC in Africa. And we're seeing here that uh, potential end users are really looking to diversify supply away from relying on DRC. Price increases this year, when we picked this project up, the cobalt price was sitting at about $25,000 a tonne, and since has run up to, to over 60,000 US a tonne, which has obviously helped us this year. Namibia, uh, when I saw this project come across my desk, I looked at probably a dozen, two dozen projects, I really wanted something in Cobalt and I wanted a DRC type of project that wasn't located in the DRC. And for me, Namibia fit the bill. I uh, had previously spent a bit of time in Namibia, so quite comfortable with the, with, uh, the whole setup there in terms of safety, in terms of uh, stability of government, in terms of excellent infrastructure and those types of things. We also have a really good partner in Namibia, a company called Gecko Namibia. They were the, originally the vendor of the project, but now with a, with a series of deals that we've done, they've actually become our largest shareholder and also have a, a, a contribution to our board. So I'll talk a little bit more about Gecko as well as we move through. Uh, in terms of the project itself, for me, this was a relatively low exploration risk project. There was already a couple of holes that had been drilled into it in the past that had indicated that there was a you know, cobalt present at, at potentially economic levels. There was a series of surface samples across about four or five kilometres of strike that indicated that it wasn't just a, a one-hit wonder. So for me, that was something that, you know, relatively low exploration risk is, is the, pro the type of projects that I like to work on to be able to develop a resource around something with relatively low risk. In terms of what we've done since we had the project, we, we started drilling out there in March with a, a reconnaissance program. We've progressed now and selected the areas that we're focusing on to get our initial drill resource. We expect to have that out in the first quarter of next year. We're also concentrating at an early stage on metallurgy. We have some attributes about this project that are really positive in terms of uh, the, the type of mineralisation that, that, that it is, that I'll go into in a little bit more detail, but it's, basically it's a copper sulphide associated project. We've got a scoping study that we're uh, currently undertaking as well, so the resource will feed into that. Uh, we've appointed uh, suitable consultants to uh, advance the key areas of metallurgy, mining studies, environmental and, uh, and costings. So just talk a little bit about the market. I won't talk too much about this, but others have already talked about it, but as I said, strong price rises this year. Uh, Battery, what we have seen as well, which is something that's not really fully appreciated by the market, is that we're seeing the cobalt chemicals that feed into these batteries actually trading at a, at a price premium to the LME metal price. So most people, when they look at the cobalt price, they look at the LME because that's what's available. Uh, we see a, we've seen a shift of Chinese EV manufacturers towards using cobalt in the, in the batteries. Previously they used, or currently they use lithium iron phosphate type of batteries, and this was a real key uh, important factor for me in wanting to get the company into cobalt, because 
I'd spent a bit of work looking at uh, with lithium companies in the past and we were, we were talking to Chinese groups that didn't use cobalt at that particular time in their batteries. However, they were asking me whether I knew about any, any cobalt projects. Um, because of this change that, that's now underway, uh, what they're looking to do is the, the Chinese government actually subsidised, the subsidies for EVs actually improve with the longer range of EVs and to get a longer range EV, basically you need to have cobalt in the formulation of the battery. Again, I just mentioned earlier, DRC, the dominant source. I can't really think of any other commodity in the world where uh, you know, such a large proportion, so about 65%, comes out of one country. And when that one country obviously has um, some, some concerns around security of supply and uh, sovereign, you know, sovereign risk and all those types of things, then it places the commodity in quite a precarious position. Just further on why we're in cobalt, uh, for me, this, these two charts here actually really summarise. If you want exposure to the EV boom and the battery boom, lithium and cobalt are clearly your two best, uh, your best exposure, as shown by the chart there on the left, with those huge increases in the market for those two commodities in terms of uh, in 100% EV world they're looking at here. But the chart on the right there is really the key, the key chart for me. If you're looking to develop, so explore for and develop a resource in one of these commodities that gives you good exposure to EVs, then as you can see on the right there, cobalt's really your best exposure. Um, basically that just talks about in 100% EV world, which we're a little way off obviously, what would the commodity uh, depletion be for the, for the known reserves of that commodity? And as you can see there, if, if every vehicle was an EV, there's only less than three years supply of cobalt. It's important to note too, this chart also takes into account this shift in battery technology from the the dominant NMC 111 technology through to an 811 technology, which is eight being the nickel. So some others have talked about the, the rise of nickel in these types of batteries. This scenario on the right here actually does take into account that sh gradual shift towards 811s by 2025. So you can still see, even in that scenario, cobalt's very important. So I talk a little bit about Namibia. Uh, as I said, I'd previously spent a little bit of time in Namibia, so quite comfortable with that as a jurisdiction. The infrastructure there, in including roads and ports and things like that, is excellent. Uh, we, we fly into the capital, Vintuk, and uh, it's probably about, about 700 kilometres up to our project site in the north there, near, uh, just near the Angolan border. And the, the time it takes to get there is only about six hours, so that gives you some idea of what the, what the road infrastructure is like. We've got good access to water and power. The uh, Rural Kanya power station is located about 100 kilometres from the project site as the crow flies, and that supplies a majority of Namibia's power. And we have transmission lines from, from that service running actually through our project site. And just a few photos there of the, the types of roads. So that, that type of bitumen road, that'll take us to within about, from the capital, uh, to within about 5Ks of the project site. So that gives you a bit of an idea. Top right there, the, uh, the, the type of road that we actually have that traverses through our project site and uh, the Royal Canyon Power Station. So I touched earlier just a little bit on Gecko Namibia. They're out. They were, we were originally earning 76% uh, interest in this project from Gecko. Uh, they approached us at, at uh, a point about three or four months ago and wanted us to switch out. They had a residual 20% and we, they wanted to switch that 20% out for equity and CLA because they didn't want to lose their uh, ability to participate in the project moving forward. We had a, a call option where we could have purchased that final 20% for $1.25 million. Obviously, given our market cap now is about 50, so that's, that's probably worth about $10 million already today, and we could have bought it for 1.25. So part of that deal, we actually, we, we were looking at uh, some of the surrounding tenements at Apuo, and we could see that this uh, geological unit we're interested in extended for far and wide, probably over more than 100 kilometres, and we, what we did was we actually got access to that ground as part of this deal, uh, which has increased our prospective horizon now to over 100 kilometres of this uh, dolomite ore formation, we call it. Part of that, we had Pine join the board, as I've already talked about, and uh, Gecko themselves are a big Namibian company. They're a, they're a diversified mining and mining services company. They operate mines in Namibia, a graphite mine, in partnership with a large European uh, graphite group named Imeris, who some of you might be familiar with. Uh, they've got a, a salt and a fluor spar mine also operating or under development. And they provide drilling services, so we don't have any problems getting access to drill rigs, and uh, a, a really competent, exploration team led by a guy named Dr. Rainer Elmus, who's a, a German national that's been in Namibia for approximately 10 years, but he's a really uh, com accomplished geologist. 
So in terms of the actual technical merits of the project itself, it's a, it's a, a copper belt style of project. So as I said at the beginning, it's, it's a DRC style of project, but not in the DRC. It's a carbon rich uh, sedimentary sequence. We've got over 100 kilometres of this uh, unit uh, now within our tenements. We focused on this area here that covers about 15 kilometres. They, that was our re reconnaissance drilling program that we conducted at the beginning of this year. And we found this unit, uh, this uh, mineralisation extended over the whole, the whole of that 15 kilometres that we've looked at so far. So it's a really, really large system. There's good potential for additional mineralised zones and duplicate zones, uh, double zones that we're just starting to uncover now as we progress our exploration. The, the mineralisation outcrops at surface. Very important is that it's low in deleterious elements, in particular in arsenic. A lot of the time cobalt minerals, as some of you might be familiar with, are, uh, uh, have arsenic in the structure of the mineral. Our mineral is, uh, a cobalt mineral is a mineral called lineite, which is a simple cobalt sulphide. So that's uh, CO3S4. And that has important implications when you start to talk about processing and creating concentrates that are low in arsenic, which is quite difficult to do in cobalt. Just some highlights there of the type of grades we're talking about here. Uh, we use around about 0.14 is the, the cobalt grade that we see here, which is about 1.4% in terms of copper equivalent. So with the copper that we also see, we also have zinc as well, but in terms of copper equivalent, we're talking around about 2%. And to put that into a Namibian context, there are mines in Namibia that uh, operate at a 0.8% uh, head grade of copper. So we think that our grades are, are certainly uh, more than acceptable and we, we, as I'll highlight in a minute, we've actually just found today, or we've announced today, just the real, some real potential for a lot higher grades and more uh, intense sulphide mineralisation. So after we drilled the first 20 holes here, the reconnaissance holes, the wide spaced holes, we, we calculated a, an initial exploration target there of 33 to 41 million tonnes. Uh, that's at 0.13 to 0.17 per cent cobalt, also with uh, the, the copper in there as well. The thing about this project is it's really hard to actually find a project that is dominated by the cobalt revenue and not reliant on a good nickel price or a good copper price. We see the, uh, the, the revenue split at our project is roughly about 70 per cent cobalt, 20 to 25 per cent uh, in, in the copper, and then there's also a little bit of zinc in there that we may or may not be able to ex extract effectively. So this is, uh, we had an announcement come out today. What we, what we were doing is we're, we're, as part of our resource drilling program, we're defining the resource down to approximately 200 or 250 metres of vertical depth. That's our program. So you see the first three holes in each line. We're basically drilling a hole 40 metres, 140 and 240 approximately in general terms. But what we did is we thought, well, okay, let's see if we can try and demonstrate that, that this system basically just keeps on going. So what we did is we stepped out uh, stepped out another 300 metres further to the north and drilled a deep hole. And uh, the aim there was to try and see if we could intercept this unit at depth. And we, we were able to do that. Uh, probably the most important thing about this is actually to do with the, the, the grade and the intensity of sulphide mineralisation that we found at this depth, which I'll talk a little bit more about in a moment. But we think that this, this discovery has obviously implications for the size, given that our exploration target was only calculated down to 100, between 150 and 250 metres, and now we've intercepted this unit at about uh, 380 metres of vertical depth. So there's obvious implications there for the size of the system, uh, but probably more importantly, there's um, the, the intensity of mineralisation that we see there, and I'll show a couple of pictures in a moment, but what we see is basically semi-massive sulphides encountered for the first time at the project. Most of the mineralisation, well, all of the mineralisation to date had been disseminated or very thin uh, vein style mineralisation, and now we're starting to see semi-massive at a bit of depth. So we're quite uh, confident that, um, that we'll be able to find some more semi-massive and hopefully massive sulphide zones as we get further into this, into this mineralised system. So in terms of uh, after we identified where we wanted to focus on for our resource drilling, we've got two key areas here as shown in the map there. Uh, we've got five drill rigs operating at the moment, three RC rigs, two diamond rigs. Uh, they'll be going flat out until mid-December. Mid-December we'll call a halt and basically as much drilling as we can get done in that time. We've got 15,000 metres planned but we'll try and get even a little bit more than that done. And then we will stop at that point and use all that data to, to calculate our, our maiden jork resource for reporting in probably early February we're aiming for for that. Uh, part of the program too, we are throwing in the occasional uh, 
deeper hole to try and test for some of these other concepts. We've got some other concepts we're looking at where we have repeat zones of this uh, mineralised unit that we're looking to try and uh, get a handle on, uh, because obviously the mineralisation we have here is probably the average thickness is about between five and somewhere between five and fourteen metres usually, and if we can find duplicate zones of this of this uh, mineralisation, that has obvious implications for things like strip ratios and the economics of mining, which is probably the key, one of the key aspects of this project now. So just looking at what we the, what we announced today, so we see um, you can see there the the sulphides that I'm talking about, this chalcopyrite here. Uh, you can see sphalerite in there as well, and the lineite, is, which is the cobalt mineral, is actually within that same spread across those uh, chalcopyrite and sphalerite units. Uh, this is something that was a, re a really a pleasant surprise for us. As I said, we were looking to see if we could just identify this mineralisation extended to depth, but to find this really gives us some confidence that, uh, that there are some uh, significant sulphide feeder zones that have actually supplied the, the material for the mineralisation that we've been defining to date. We've got a metallurgical test work program that's currently underway. Uh, basically, one of the key, the key aspects of this project is that it is simple sulphide mineralogy. So we're finding that we're able to create mineral concentrates by conventional flotation techniques. And at the moment, we're just trying to maximise that recovery and maximise that cobalt grade in, in concentrate to, uh, to, to levels that we think are very impressive to the market. I mentioned earlier we've started a scoping study, so we've just got some of the key consultants there. For metallurgy, we've got Allway Mineral Consultants, who are based here in Perth, uh, supported by Hydromet, who are run by a guy, a guy named Grenville Dunn, who's got a lot of experience in these African uh, copper belt type ores, but lives here in Perth. Uh, SGS Australia here in uh, Malaga are undertaking the actual physical test work. We have Allway also undertaking these CAPEX and OPEX estimates for us for a scoping study level of accuracy. Uh, mining studies, a small group here in Perth named Aurelia, who are supported by our, our partners in Namibia Gecko uh, in terms of providing local costs into that, and a South African group that we're looking, look, uh, using to conduct our resource modelling and estimation. So we've, we've also commenced activities such as baseline environmental studies, just trying to get ahead of the game for what we plan to be doing next year, which will really be completing this scoping study and then moving straight into a, a, feasibility a more detailed feasibility study after that. Just a quick, quick bit on peer comparison. Um, as some have said, it's really hard to try and find a cobalt project. It's really hard to try and line different cobalt projects up. Um, I guess the point I'd make on that is that, that not all cobalt projects are, are the same. You've got to really look at the type of project. And the type of project we have is a, is a copper sulphide associated project, which in my opinion are the best types of projects. Nickel sulphide projects, of course, are, are quite good as well. Then you have the other types such as nickel laterites, which are ten, tend to be uh, uh, larger, but generally higher capex and opex, and then you have some of these uh, arsenide type projects that have arsenic in the structure of the cobalt mineral, so perhaps not quite as attractive as, as what we have here. In terms of our peer comparisons here, um, we expect this bubble will start to drift up in that direction, so we think there'll be a lot more, a much larger size. This is really just based on that initial exploration target, and of course the grade that we've got there is just the uh, you know, the grade that we've already calculated based on the initial work we did and doesn't take into account any of this uh, deeper, potentially higher grade mineralisation. Thank you very much.